international relations and I'm currently also the director of Law Justice and Society program. Dr. Julian Womble is our speaker today, but before I introduce him, let me say a couple of uh, things about the program and the series. Law Justice and Society is a minor that we introduced in 2016, uh, approximately four years back. Uh, we started with uh, just seven minors uh, that year, and now LJS is the third largest minor very close to the top two. And so uh, the minor has been really uh, doing well. Uh, just to give you a sense of how we have conceptualized this minor, I want to briefly uh, read out from our description so that uh, people who are interested can get a sense of uh, what we do. So Law Justice and Society minor provides an interdisciplinary perspective on law. It studies the complex way in which law works in society and the integral relationship of law with justice. The law is not a tool or technique to be mastered or manipulated. Law emerges out of struggles over social, political, and cultural values. It affects different communities differently, and law shapes society and shaped by it. Today's lecture is a continuation of a series of programs that we have put together in the last four years. Our annual lectures have always been focused on the issue of race, justice, equality, and human dignity. This particular lecture is different and it's a part of a series of conversation that we have started on race and justice. This series of conversations is, is inspired by the racial justice movement that took a powerful form in the wake of killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky by uniformed police officers. The movement not only, not only inspired street protests for weeks across the US and globally, but also forced institutions of different kinds to deal with the question of race and black lives. Drew University has also not been untouched by that. On Drew campus, we have had several conversations over summer led by black students demanding greater institutional attention to the issue of racial equality and justice. And so this series takes inspiration from conversation by Drew students over the summer, and it is an attempt to carry those conversations forward. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to thank the Department of Political Science and International Relations, uh, the Ross Traffigan Distinguished Alumni Speaker Series Funds, Black Student Union, Roosevelt Institute for co-sponsoring the program. I also want to thank uh, Dean uh, Ryan Hendricks and Provost Jessica Lakin for supporting this event. Now to our distinguished speaker. Uh, Dr. Julian Womble is a graduate of Drew University the class of 2011 and a political science major. We in political science department are really proud of him. Drew University is very proud of him. Uh, he's an assistant professor of political science at George Washington University. His research examines the relationship between race and politics. Specifically, he investigates the relationship between black voters, use of race in their political decisions. He is the recipient of the 2019 American Political Science Association's Award for Best Dissertation in Racial and Ethnic Politics. Currently, he's working on his book manuscript uh, titled, We Choose You, Investigating Black Voter Candidate Selection, which offers a new way of thinking about how black voters use race as a means by which to select political candidates to support. His research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, and he has published in the Journal of Politics Politics groups, groups and Identities, PS, Political Science and Politics. He has also contributed to the Monkey Cage blog of Washington Post, 538 blog, NPR, Code Switch, uh, podcast, etc. So uh, without further ado, please help, help me welcome Professor Julian Womble. Thank you so much. Let's see if this works. So I also want to echo um, Professor Mishra's uh, thanks and gratitude to the um, Law, Justice, and Society program for having me. It is such a pleasure to be back. I want to um, put out a special shout out to Professor McGuinn uh, because without him, I would not be standing here right now. Um, he saw something in me that I certainly did not see in myself and really pushed me to uh, pursue political science and academy as a career. Um, and so here we are. 
So thank you to him and thank you to all the professors um, in the political science um, and international relations uh, department. Uh, my time at Drew was an amazing time and I learned so much and I used so much of it, uh, of what I've learned um, in my everyday life. Uh, and so without further ado, I want to, well, first let me set my timer so that I don't go over. Um, that's not it. There we go. So I want us to think about today um, this post-racial identity politics paradox. So one of the great things about being a professor is that I don't have to have a lot of answers. I just have to have really good questions. And so what's going to happen today is that I'm going to give us a lot of questions and some of them I'll answer and some of them I won't. Um, and the ones that I won't, I hope that they're interesting enough that you think about them as you um, continue thinking about this topic and listening to other talks. So here's where we are. This is a list of the, of this is a kind of truncated list in some regards of the people who have had their lives taken at the hands of police. And so this is the moment that we find ourselves in, as Professor Mishra alluded to, here's where we are, right? Where we are having black lives and brown lives being taken at the hands of employees of the state. And this has led us to a number of, of protests and marches in the name of making sure that black lives are honored and that their significance and their worth are known. And this is happening not just in the United States, this is happening everywhere. This is happening all around the globe. So what you see here is a map of all the different marches that have happened globally in the name of George Floyd and in the name of Black Lives Matter. And so we find ourselves in a very important moment where we are seeing people coming together and saying something needs to change whether it be defunding the police, whether it be si simply acknowledging the humanity of black and brown people in the United States and globally, something has to change. But we also find ourselves here. So this is a segment of an email that was sent by Sergeant Jonathan Madden Lee of the Louisville Metropolitan Police Department. Um, he was one of the officers involved in the murder of Breonna Taylor. And he says here in the, in the um, highlighted text, we as police do not care if you are black, white, Hispanic, Asian, what you identify as this week. We aren't better than anyone. This is not an us against society, but it is good versus evil. We are sons, daughters, husbands, wives, partners, brothers, sisters, dads, and moms. We are human beings with flaws, feelings, and emotions. Now this statement is not one that is unique to him, this calling together, this color blindness, this idea that somehow I don't care what you look like. We are all humans and we all share in this unity, right? We see this and we have seen this used by police officers. We've seen it used by politicians. So here's a quote from uh, Dr. Ben Carson when he was running for president. He says, the skin color, the skin doesn't make them who they are. The hair doesn't make them who they are. It's time for us to move beyond that. And so this is also something that is not coming just from the right. This is coming from the left as well. This is a quote from Chris Matthews, um, formerly of MSNBC, where he was talking about um, after the first, after President Obama's first um, State of the Union address, he says, I hope what I saw is true that we've gotten beyond it, it being race. I think he's taken us beyond black and white in our politics so wonderfully in just a year. And so here we find ourselves in this weird paradox, right, where we're seeing the lives of Black people being taken mercilessly, and we're also seeing this call of people saying, well, we need to move past this. We need to move beyond race. We need to move to a place where, you know, we can just acknowledge each other's humanity. And the reality is, is that this is a kind of, these are parts of different kinds of languages, right? And so one way that we see people kind of using this racialized rhetoric is a deracialized language, right? Which is to say that there's no usage of race in, its, in the rhetoric at all. So this is something that people often attribute to the way that Barack Obama ran his first campaign, where he very rarely talked about race unless he absolutely had to. Um, and racialized issues, he kind of moved around them in ways that didn't require him to speak about them explicitly. 
And then we also have colorblind uh, rhetoric, which is kind of what we saw used by Sergeant Mattingly, right? So there's no moment in time that references that they reference in order to kind of say why we need to move beyond. It ignores a history of past discrimination and it tends to be scholarship tells us supported by older people. And then we move into this post-racialism, right? So this is a more of, a, of, of what Ben Carson was invoking for us. So we see um, that the idea of, you know, society has transcended race, right, for a specific reason, right, and one of the big examples that we often see is the election of President Barack Obama, and we know that during that time, once he was elected, the kind of invocation of post-racialism increased exponentially. Everyone was talking about the fact that we had moved beyond race. Everyone was speaking about how it is that we have transcended race, right? And it's interesting, there was a, a recent um, news report that I was watching about a man who had voted for President Obama and then subsequently voted for President Trump. And when asked why, he said, voting for President Obama was to um, apologize for the sins of our country and voting for President Trump was to, um, find someone who would protect this nation. And so in that, right, we have this, this moment where, we seeing the, where we're seeing the election of President Obama as being a very important moment for lots of people. And that this isn't something that's just supported or purported by people on the right or Republicans. This is something that people on the left who are young are pushing for, right? This desire to move beyond race, to be above it, to transcend it. And so that this can acknowledge racial discrimination, which is you know, something that is different than per se the colorblindness, right? It acknowledges that past ills, but it also acknowledges that we've moved beyond those things and that we are in a different age of race. And so we know that somehow like, you know, that in this moment we find ourselves in, it's a bit harder to believe this, but the reality is, is that people like this rhetoric. And so what I'm showing you here is a graph from an article that I wrote with my colleague Cheryl Laird. And what we did was we manipulated the way that politicians talked about race and we talked about certain things. And we asked, we had, they either had a Republican um, candidate or they had a Democratic candidate. And what you can see if you look all the way to the right of your screen is that in the post-racial column, that is the highest evaluations. So this is a feeling thermometer, which is to say that these are kind of degrees, right? So the, the lower the degree, the more cool, the less you're like, the higher, the warmer, the better. And so what we can see here is that relative to other kinds of rhetoric, whether it be deracialized, whether it be more racially negative or racially compassionate, when you invite someone and say, we need to move beyond race, people like that. And it doesn't matter if they are a Republican or a Democrat, or this is another example where we, because we also manipulated the race. So whether they were black or white, and so this speaks to the, um, the ways in which we understand post-racial rhetoric, the fact and the fact that people like it. And so as we think about this, I know that we are kind of in this moment where kind of thinking about things being post-racial doesn't really make a lot of sense because we're so racialized right now. But we're also finding ourselves in a moment where people are calling for the end of identity politics, right? They're saying we need to end it. And so these are just some headlines that I've snatched kind of from online. And you can see that there's a long conversation about the ways in which people are wanting us to kind of move into a, the idea of identity politics and move past it and say like, you know, it's a dead end, there's a battle. And so there's a lot of negativity around the idea of identity politics. So what is it? So identity politics, as defined by Merriam-Webster's dictionary, is basically when individuals use an identity, whether it be racial, religious, ethnic, social, as a means by which to kind of promote that identity's kind of um, concerns and interest. And the, this, uh, this definition has, adds the caveat that they're doing this without regard to concerns for a larger political group. And what we'll see later on in a few slides is kind of the way in which that caveat is a very big part of this debate about identity politics. And so here are just some quotes about the ways in which people are kind of conceptualizing identity politics. So this is a quote from former governor um, of California, Jerry Brown. When you get caught in the maw of identitarian feelings and movements, it becomes very difficult to keep at the more general level that unites people. 
This is a quote from an author of The Lies That Bind, who said, identity can become the enemies of human solidarity, the sources of war, horsemen, and of a score of apocalypses from apartheid to genocide. And so what we see here is this kind of idea of the use of identity in, as one's kind of lens through which they're able to see the world is, is seen as a very negative thing, partially because it's seen as very divisive, right? That people are using these identities and it's tearing us apart and we can't unite if we're so focused on the things that separate us. But how did identity get into politics and who put it there? How is it that we've come to conceptualize this? And so what I'm gonna do from here on out is kind of give us a bit of a historical perspective. And so I'm gonna focus most of this particular inquiry on the experience of black Americans. And so I wanna be very specific in this in kind of the, the language that I'm using because there are obviously black Americans who are descendants of um, slavery, and then there are Black immigrants who may not have that same level of ancestry and lived experience. And so that there are going to be parts of what I'm saying that are unique and specific to those individuals. And when we're talking about identity politics, a lot of the conversations, as the definition connoted, suggests that, you know, there are different kinds of identities. Generally speaking, though, when we're reading about it in the newspaper and when we're thinking about it in terms of the political space, they're generally talking about it in a lot of ways um, in terms of race. And so it's going to be that particular identity that I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of this talk. So who put identity into politics? So this is the census. Now, I know you can't see this whole thing, and that's OK. I just need you to be able to see the colors, right? So the census started in 1790. And this spans from 1790 to 2020. And what you can see is that there is a drastic addition of color as time goes on. So what we see up top is a red color. And so the, the red color is our black people. Um, the blue, the light blue color that spans right underneath the numbers is white. And so what's interesting about this is that the census identifies people, right? The census is the thing that you check, we check what our race is. But from 1790 to 1960, you, an individual did not check their own race. They were identified by someone else. So this identity was placed on them. They were given this identity. And then a slew of other decisions politically were then made with that information. So this is to say that they had people come to your home and say, oh, I see you, I'm checking the boxes, I'm listening to you, but they're identifying you. So in this moment, we can see the state, we can see the government placing an identity on individuals. And this is an important thing for us to think about as we think about what identity politics is and who, who is using it and where it comes from. And so what we see here over time is these changes in terms of who is included and in 2020, we have more options than we've ever had. And there are still people who feel underrepresented on the census. And so this is to say that the way that we've conceptualized identity starts here in a lot of ways. It starts with the way in which you are being defined by the state. And this is a quote from the notes um, on the state of Virginia by Thomas Jefferson. And I will call your attention to the bold and italicized um, aspect of, of this text which says, I advance it therefore as suspicion only that the Blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. Now, this is one of the luminaries of our country, one of our founding fathers, providing a very clear definition, even if only by suspicion, about the perceived inferiority of Black people. So again, this is a person who is listened to by thought leaders and political leaders. And it is here he's placing and speaking like many people, not, this was not something that was unique to him at the time, right? But he's speaking about the perceived inferiority of an entire group of people in the same way that the census grouped people together based on their race for years without any consent or insight of the actual people just based on what someone else saw, this quote provides us with some sense of the ways in which other people were viewing Black bodies and juxtaposing them with white ones. 
This is a quote from uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney, who uh, during the Dred Scott v. San Sanford case. And it says here, a free Negro of the African race whose ancestors were brought to this country and sold as slaves is not a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States. Again, this is codified into law, what it means to be Black. So often we hear the notion that race is a social construct, right? There's a physical part and then there's a social part. And if we think about that social part, the way in which Black individuals were able to move throughout society was dictated not only by the sentiments reflected in the census, not only in the sentiments reflected by Thomas Jefferson and, and his and the people who are around him and thinking very similarly to him, but also in the very laws that defined the way that people lived their lives. Now, this is an important thing for us to think about as we try to reconcile this paradox of post-raciality and identity politics, because we, an entire group of people had had their rights denied, their humanity, their very citizenship denied based on the words of a group of white men. This is very important for us to remember as we continue to conceptualize what this looks like for us now. Here's another case. Uh, this is Plessy B. Ferguson. Again, I'll draw your attention to the bolded and italicized words. But in the nature of things, it could not have been intended, it being the 14th Amendment, to abolish distinctions based upon color. And Plessy B. Ferguson is a very historical case because it upholds and it provides the language for separate but equal. And so again, we're seeing in law, we're seeing the ways in which race and identity are being used to great effect to create division. And, and a lot of the more negative aspects of this are being placed onto a group who at the time of all of these decisions and most of these statements have very little say in the way that they're able to live their lives. But during this time, Black people weren't dormant, right? They didn't just kind of sit there we know that during slave times, there were rebellions. We know about the civil rights movement. We're looking at a moment right now where Black people and their allies are all coming together and saying, we have to stop this. And so the question is, is how is it that during all of this time that Black people were able to navigate this space just despite the fact that there were lots of roadblocks in their way, both legally and socially? And so I turn to the work of Michael Dawson, who talks about the Black utility heuristic. And then this, he talks to us and he basically says that for Black people, their racial identity is the lens through which they view the world. Now this makes sense. If you've been subjugated on the grounds of this identity, it then makes sense that this would be the way that you are going to view and navigate the world. If the census has told you that this is who you are and all of the way that you're treated throughout history has been based on this one identity, then naturally you're going to then see the world through this, through it this way. And so Michael Dawson comes to us with this heuristic. In the work of um, Cheryl Laird and Ishmael White, they argue that they that black people in the midst of all of this have created a structure outside of formalized politics that has basically pushed the agenda of the group right the interest of the group and maintain solidarity within the group by way of using social sanctions to make sure that those who might be in um who might be more likely to kind of to deviate from what the group wants to not do that, right? And so they use social sanctions. And in a couple of slides, I'll explain to you kind of what that is. And then there's my own work. I don't have a book yet, so you're just gonna have to, this, this is gonna have to do. Um, but I argue that Black voters take this idea of using sanctions and thinking about the ways in which as a group, they have to optimize their political position despite the amount of, um, discrimination, right? And so they have to strategically make choices. And one of the ways that they do this is they look for commitment in the people who they seek to, um, who they, who seek to represent them. And so 
they do this by making certain kinds of, of do using certain kinds of calculus to be able to say, okay, so are you for us or are you against us? And that this is an important thing for us to think about because it is not always true that the person who's going to be the most preferable for black voters is going to be a black person. And so what does this look like in the real world? So what this looks like is a very strong cohesive support for a party that it, at least is seen as being more amenable to helping black people than the other party. So we're in a two party system. So we're constrained, right? We, there's only but so much we can do as a group. And what we know, especially now, is that the Republican Party, despite a lot of the recent appeals, is not going to be the party that is going to offer the clearest path to an optimization and social equality and political equality for the Black community. And so we see this very strong cohesion around the Democratic Party. And part of that is maintained, uh, which is what uh, professors Laird and White tell us, through this idea of social sanctioning and the social dynamics with which Black people have had to operate because they weren't allowed into formal political spaces. And now I show you this because I want to kind of make it clear about the way, the strategic nature with which Black people use their identity. So here we see that earlier on, this is from a, um, a poll that was conducted in February, Joe Biden, his candidacy during the Democratic primary was less than stellar. Let's go with that. And what we see is that, you know, that there were other people who were doing much better than him. Fast forward to the South Carolina primary, where Black voters basically snatched his campaign out of a ditch, let's call it a ditch, and revitalized his campaign. And so what you can see if you look to the left, uh, I mean, to the right, I'm sorry, to the last week on um, the February 23rd to 25th, is you can see that support for Biden is strong among, stronger amongst Black voters. But after the South Carolina primary, we see a much stronger uptick, both from Black Democratic primaries and Democratic primary voters overall. And so this is a point that I really want to make very clear because I think when this happened, a lot of people came out and were like, oh no, Black voters don't know what they're doing. This is why identity politics is bad. But if the goal of voters, particularly Democratic voters, is to get a candidate who they believe can beat Donald Trump, which is what Black voters were looking for, the cohesion and the strategy to be able to do that and to recognize that power is something that cannot and should not be understated. And here is, this is the most recent example of what I've talked about so far. So this is uh, Meg Thee Stallion, and this is her performance on Saturday Night Live this past Saturday. And what you can see here is if you read, it says Daniel Cameron, who is the Attorney General of Kentucky, is no different than the sellout Negroes that sold our people into slavery. Now, these are very strong words. But this is a moment where we're able to see, again, the strategic understanding that Black voters have about the importance of being seen as a, as, as a Black person who cares about the community. And she uses this language and she uses this platform to call out someone who was perceived and is perceived as someone who was not working on behalf of the group. So the paradox, everything that I've shown you so far has brought us to a place where it's hard for us to really grapple with how we're supposed to end identity politics when the individuals and the groups that are using identity politics are simply using the tools that were given to them by white society. Black people didn't ask to be defined in certain ways. They didn't ask to be treated in certain ways by the Supreme Court, by their neighbors, by white society broadly construed, right? And so the idea that we would then move away from this very strong identity begs the question of who is doing the moving? Is it the group of people who are using the tools that were given to them and placed upon them by the census, by the Supreme Court, and have somehow navigated this, this very, very treacherous terrain in order to garner some level of equality and equity 
And now we're being called upon to move beyond that. But it begs a bigger question because that suggests that identity politics is a one-way street. And the only people who are invoking it are people who are in marginalized communities. But the reality is, is that if we look at the quotes from the Supreme Court justices and from the, if we look at the census, that identity politics is everywhere. And that all of these individuals are using identity politics the same way. Right? White people are not immune to identity politics, and we can talk about that in the Q&A, right? that there is something very inherent about the use of identity politics. And so when we ask for people to move beyond them or call upon the end of identity politics, one important question that I'm not going to answer for us is, who is the one doing it? Who's moving? Is it, is it the people who are using the identities that were placed upon them? Or is it the people who are doing the placing? And then it begs another question is if this happens, if we move beyond, if let's say, let's thought experiment, black people move beyond race and race was no longer salient, would this stop? Would this stop? The pursuit of black life, the Black Lives Matter movement is literally the goal, right, of ending identity politics, right? It's the desire to make it clear that all lives do matter, but they can't matter until Black lives matter. And so that this push is not one that's meant to divide. It's one that's meant to put a microscope on the fact that there is a population of people who are being disproportionately taken away. And so that if it is true that the goal of Move, removing past identity politics and moving beyond race is to unite us. Well, then that requires everyone, right? Not just the people who are being marginalized to work on this. And so again, it's important for us to remember that these individuals are just using the tools and that this is happening everywhere. That, every, that everywhere around the globe, people are asking to come together and to unite but what's important is that we can't do this in a vacuum. It's impossible for us to do this in this contemporary moment and forget history. So some of us may say, well, everything that you showed us was all old. We've made a lot of progress since then. And that is true, we have made progress, but a forgotten history is one that's doomed to, re to repeat itself, right? We cannot forget how we got here and we got here because identity was placed on these individuals and these individuals then took that identity and made it work for them in the best way that they knew and were able to do. Now this is a very popular quote and I'll end with this. And this is a very popular quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it's often one that people are using when they're talking about the desire to move into a post-racial society. I have a dream that my four little children will, be, will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. And so the last question that I have for us today is, how can this be true when the very content of one's character is contingent on the color of their skin? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Womble. That was a very insightful talk and kind of one of the paradoxes that we have been uh, struggling with in our politics, in our society, how to think about identity and identity politics, and how to think about uh, a race. Uh, so uh, mm, we have a lot of time for discussion. Uh, we are at 7.36, so uh, 45, 50 minutes approximately or more than that. We have time. So what I'm going to do is uh, mm, I'll ask you to formulate your question and I'll ask you to raise your hand electronically. So if you go to participant button, most of you would know it. Uh, you can see uh, an option of raising your hand. So raise your hand and I'm going to call on you. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to uh, bunch a few questions together, maybe two or three questions together. And then we'll, uh, we can go uh, through the question, right? And I would uh, encourage you to uh, keep it very crisp, the question, so that uh, uh, we can uh, allow uh, many people to raise questions. And I want to replicate kind of the way in which we conduct 
uh, conversations when we are on campus, right? We want to make it more interactive, right? So as you formulate your questions, I, mm, I would just make a couple of announcements. I don't, I don't see any hands up yet. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm going to, so as you formulate your questions, I'm going to make a couple of announcements before we start taking the questions. So, um, and these are all uh, events and talks that uh, political science uh, is organizing, political science and other uh, departments are organizing uh, around elections. So there's a talk tomorrow by uh, Professor Yordan at 7 p.m. And the talk is titled, What Donald Trump and Joe Biden's Twitter Feed Can Teach Us. Uh, it's at 7 p.m. tomorrow. The talk is organized by the Office of Alumni and Parent Communities. Uh, you should be able to find Zoom link easily. Uh, there is a second, there is a pre-election panel organized by Political Science and IR on October 16th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, and there is a post-election panel on November 12th, same time, 7 to 8.30 uh, we will have um, people from the department uh, on the panel basically talking about uh, how the election is going to pan out and how, and if there is an outcome, then how to think about that, right? So with that, I'm going to uh, call out on people to, uh, to articulate the questions. So Nathaniel. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, um, Professor, for um, giving this speech. Um, I want to preface this by saying that I'm not um, a political science person, I'm a literature student, but um, I was interested in connecting this discussion with um, Isabel Wilkerson's new book, Cast. Um, Wilkerson kind of makes an argument that um, terms like race have kind of lost all meaning when, you know, Donald Trump says that he doesn't have a racist bone in his body or that he's done the most for women out of anyone in the world, you know. Um, she's saying that um, words like racist or sexist have kind of lost all meaning and kind of can't be used anymore to effectively call out um, racist behavior. And what she instead argues is that, um, Turn, um, to kind of adopt the phrasing of India and in using terms like dominant caste or lower caste to describe social inequities. Um, I'm not sure how to formulate this into a question, but I was wondering, like, maybe is there a connection between the moving forward past into this idea of post-racialism um, along with the idea of getting rid of terms like racist um, at all? Julian, should we take a couple more or you want to sure start with this question? That's fine. Yeah. Uh, Professor McGuinn. You have to unmute. Matt, can you help? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get who the person was. Sorry. Uh, Professor McGuinn. McGuinn? Uh, Patrick McGuinn? They're scared of unmuting me, Julian. You understand why. <laughs> Julian, um, so great to see you. I wish it was in person, but um, fantastic to hear your presentation. It was wonderful. And so very, very proud of you and, and so excited for your, your new adventure here at, at GW. Um, so great, as always, learned a lot from listening to you. You know, I, I'm curious in the contemporary moment, you know, the Trump era, which obviously has a lot of implications for your work, you know, clearly Trump has tapped into something which maybe many of us, to your point, thought we were past uh, in terms of sort of white um, racial fear um, and anger, particularly among white men, particularly among the polls tell us um, white men without a college degree. Um, what, what do you recommend, you know, from a strategic standpoint for democratic candidates, not, not, you know, for the Democratic Party, not just in the presidential election, but certainly that too. Is, is it best to just ignore these folks and sort of write them off and, and give up on them? Or is there some way to appeal to them and to try to address 
you know, the, the fears and the, and the anger that they have as the United States becomes inexorably a, a more diverse, racially and ethnically diverse nation. That's a lot, sorry. No, no problem. Let's, let's go with these two. Uh, sure. Um, so to Nathan's question, I think this is a really interesting thing to think about because I think that there is this level of desensitization that has come with, you know, everything feels racist now, right? And I think we've heard this kind of rhetoric used a lot where they're like, well, you know, what, and, and it's hard to define, right? What is racist? And, you, and we've, we've kind of pared some things down in our discussion and talking about things like microaggressions and things, right? But it's still very difficult to pin down like, what is racist and what isn't, right? And so when we think about racism, we tend to think about very big things like the Klan, right? And so one of the things that I, you know, that I talk to my students a lot about is that, you know, this is, there are much smaller things in the Klan that are um, still very important and they're still kind of racist. And so I think the idea of moving away and using different kinds of rhetoric to describe becomes difficult, if not because we, it's, so it's a double-edged sword, I think. We as a society have come, become so used to things on the ground of race. Um, I think we'd have to define caste. And there's no guarantee, right, that, that what the kind of desensitization to racism as a construct wouldn't exist for caste, right? Because I think one of the tricky parts of it is that it's the redefining. And I think that that's one of the things that we've been struggling with as a society is that for different groups, racism means very different things and it looks very differently. And that that dynamic makes it very complicated then for us to be able to kind of tap into what it is and what it isn't. And then it makes it difficult for us to then say, okay, like I know it, because people will say like, I know racism when I see it, um, which is like, will you? <laughs> uh, and, and so I think that there are ways for us to think about kind of whether or not changing the name is going to change the mentality that comes with these concepts, right? And so, you know, whether we change it to caste or we keep it at racism, the idea that um, we can just kind of muddy those waters in terms of the meaning, I think it's going to be something that we're kind of stuck with. Um, and it makes it difficult for us to be able to really nail down because I think no one wants to be racist and no one wants to um, be seen as being up, you know, in an upper, in a dominant caste, right? Like that's something that we always know that no one wants to be seen as an overlord, right? It makes people very uncomfortable. And I think that that reality, that kind of emotional psychological aspect is the thing that is like really part of why the definitions are switching and changing as much as they are. Um, to, uh, so I hope that answers your question. Um, to Professor McGuinn's question, you know, um, this is, it is a hard one because I think that there is, um, I think it is one thing to want to reach out to these individuals who are kind of filled with fear as the, the, the nation they knew is no longer the nation that they live in, right? And, um, or the one that they see, right? That their neighborhoods probably haven't changed that much, but they feel that it has. And so I think that it's hard to change emotion. Like it's hard to kind of get people to come to terms with, you know, change in general. And generally these, this population of people tend to be older, tend to be, you know, much more set in their ways, which then makes it even, makes it more difficult because there's a level of obstinate there that becomes very difficult to, to move. Um, and so what the Democrats do with that, I think, you know, Part of me wants to say, so there's like the, the optimistic part and then the cynical part. So the optimistic part is saying, you know, try to um, empathize with these individuals. Like if Joe Biden got up there and said like, I am an old white guy. Like I know what it is to be an old white guy and I know, and I can at least understand on some fundamental level where you are and here's how I got out of that. Here's how I moved. This is what changed for me. I could argue that, that that's possible, right? Like we could see that maybe some people would be moved by that. Because what also is true is that this fear is born out of a fear of being ignored. 
And so perhaps that overcoming that fear is by not ignoring them and speaking truth to that, but by using one's own experience. The cynical part of me says like, you know, as the country continues to change, that fear is only gonna become greater. And so then what do we do with that? And, and perhaps, you know, what we also know is that because of the way partisanship is operating right now, a lot of the people who are in this category are Republicans. And so Joe Biden could go over there and pour his heart out about kind of his like transformation on, on issues of race. And they might not, and they probably won't listen because it's easy to write off. But, and then we also know, right, and again, this is the cynical part, that like Republicans are less inclined to kind of vocalize about race this way in a way that would be much um, kind of invoking of a, uh, of, a, of a shared experience because, you know, that's just not part of the party brand. And so I think it's not impossible, but it's a question of political strategy. Um, and for the Democrats, I don't know that it would be worth it for them only because as much as I think it is possible, it could be possible for some, given uh, the, certain, the right kind of messaging, I think that because party polarization is what it is right now, that having a democratic moniker attached to your name is gonna be uh, an issue from the beginning. So I, I'm sorry, that's not a rosier picture. All right, so um, next, uh, we'll take two more questions uh, once. Uh, so Marwa and then Monique. Marwa, can you unmute yourself? Uh, Matt, can you help? Yep, I got it. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very insightful. My question pertains to the leftist community, which comprises its own division. So my question is about class reductionist leftists. So for instance, like one very prominent black Marxist political scientist, Adolf Reed, he released an article, it was very interesting this summer about police brutality. He said, Police brutality is a class issue, not a race issue, because if you look at the data, it shows that people being killed by police are typically lower income or poor. Mm -hmm. um, given that, I wanted to hear your thoughts about class reductionism, and if you think that restructuring um, the economy, would that diminish the glare of identity, or are um, class reductionist thinkers missing the point? Thank you. No problem. I, this is a great question. And I think the way I view these things, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we, we're waiting for Monique. Monique's going to go next and then I'll do this. Yes, yes, Monique. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Julian. Monique. How are you? I'm, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing awesome. So I, I happened to watch SNL the other night um, and uh, my stepdaughter is a big fan of Megan the Stallion. So I thought, oh, I'm going to watch it. And I was really um, struck by her performance. Like it just was very powerful in that what she ended with was, you know, love your black women, love your black men, respect, love and respect them. And I just thought, wow, what a powerful message on, um, you know, on, uh, uh, on TV, you know, to have by a black woman and, you know, um, and, and it got me thinking about, uh, interestingly enough, you know, when you, when you talk about identity politics, the um, white women and I recently had a conversation with um, someone from our congregation, from my congregation, who, white woman who, you know, considers herself a progressive and is really sort of thinking that once Donald Trump is out of office, that everything will sort of go back to normal. And I found myself sort of, you know, I was kind of perplexed by that because none of this started with Donald Trump and it certainly isn't going to end, but it was sort of struck me as these two different, very different identities, you know, black women who, you know, as she said, is one of the most disrespected or actually that was Malcolm X's um, 
ter- or sp- his uh, quote, one of the most disrespected people on this earth and white women who, you know, um, you know, we see um, use, uh, you know, they, they've been able to sort of, um, in, in some cases, you know, they look to keep white supremacy going. And it almost felt like, you know, that that was sort of what, um, what she was doing. So I'm, I guess my, my question is, is what your thought is on that, like in terms of, you know, the identity politics and how yeah. black women see themselves or white women see, you know, see themselves and, and how that, um, you know, plays into the whole post-racial um, point of view. Sure, sure. Okay. So, um, Marwa, did I say that right? Great. Um, so this question is an interesting one, right? Because we, I tend to think of race and class kind of running in very parallel lines with one another. Um, and so to say that, I mean, to say that police brutality is a class issue, not a race issue, I think erases the reality that your class is an internal it's difficult to externalize unless, because even if you, like if I was walking around in this outfit right now, someone would say, well, at least he has a job, right? But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be um, profiled. And we've had any number of situations and cases where prominent people, um, I believe in Minneapolis, a a prominent basketball player was a victim of police brutality himself, um, that, that that is not, that to be of a certain class means that you are some ways removed from this. Now, there's no denying that there's a privilege that comes along with class, that is true. Um, But that at the same time, um, the, that that reality does not, is not inherent in the way that you're presented, right? So even if you are wearing all kinds of clothes, someone in the comment section just referenced uh, Skip Gates getting stopped at his own home. He's a very prominent, well-known um, professor at, at Harvard of all places, right? And so that, this is to say that um, when we think about the relationship between class and race, there's a part of that that ha- the externality matters here, right? And so that I don't necessarily think that you know class reductionists are you know are off are don't, are missing something, but I think that we have to kind of remember that these ideas of kind of who it is that gets um, profiled or you know brutalized by the police that class plays some part of this, right? Because you could argue that, well, it's less likely to happen because if you're living in, a, in an under police neighborhood, then you're probably less likely to be a victim of police brutality, right? And so that, and that has a lot of validity to it, but I don't, but I think that there, that speaks to a much broader kind of bigger part of the role that class plays. And that like, you know, if you are just walking around in the street, no one knows how much money, um, no one knows how much money you have which means that like the, the idea that you would not be a victim is, um, is hard, it's, it's, it's hard to believe. Um, and I think that we have to, and so I think that thinking about these two things as kind of parallel streams and recognizing that there are cases where class will be better and class will help you more, but there are also cases where race is gonna trump that and that there's nothing that the amount of money you have isn't gonna stop that from being true is also just as important to remember. Um, and so um, I hope that that at least touched on what it is that you were wanted to touch on. Um, and then to Monique's point, so I think that, um, so there's a lot of work that came out after 2016, a lot of political science work that really put, to, like tried to pull together an understanding of kind of what happened with white women. Right, because everyone had this belief based on this premise of identity politics that white women were going to support Hillary Clinton because she was a white woman. And so that this was going to be kind of, uh, was going to be a rallying cry for her. And then it didn't happen, right? And then we had the 53% or so women who supported Donald Trump. And I think that in some ways that, and so there's a lot of work that comes out that says that there's, 
because there's a such a high amount of kind of um, variability and white womanhood, right? The experience of being white women, it's although like externally we have placed on them group groupness, it is not inherently true for a lot of white women. And that a lot of the ways in which white womanhood has been constructed kind of, it does benefit from white supremacy in very meaningful ways. Um, and so we do, and we've seen this, right? That if we think about um, the number of, of women, white women who have called the police on black men in random places, right? For doing random things or on black people in general, right? There's an understanding, I think her name was Amy Cooper. If that feels like a million years ago. Um, but the idea that we saw that understanding of her own positionality, right? As a white woman, as she made that phone call. And so there are parts of this, which isn't to say, right? That white women aren't enduring sexism and any number of other discriminatory practices but that there's an understanding of at least what their whiteness, the purchase of their whiteness, right? And so I think that that is also something that we're seeing in this relationship with kind of how the navigation of Donald Trump, right? Um, and so um, that means that, you know, there is this belief, and this is one of my biggest fears, is that people are gonna be like, well, when Donald Trump leaves, everything is back to normal and life is gonna go back to the way that it was. And that I think is a terrifying prospect to think about because so much of the progress that has been made has been made because people have become aware finally of what's been going on. And so um, some of that has to do with Trump, but to your point, Monique, right, this didn't just spring up from the ground with him. And so I think that, you know, really calling out the ways in which kind of white supremacy pervades the lived experiences of white people, both men and women, is really important for us to kind of keep harping on, even if it happens that Donald Trump doesn't win again in a few weeks. All right. So we take uh, mm, next two questions. Uh, uh, Liz Anderson and Sean Backey. Liz, go ahead. Are you unmuted? Matt? Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi. Thank you so much, Dr. Womble. Um, so my question um, does kind of regard, um, I mean, going back to identity politics and removing that, mm -hmm. it, it, like, let's say that we as a society decided to kind of move past identity politics, to move past, um, you know, labels like race. Is that even a feasible thing for us to do? Because in that case, we wouldn't only be looking at race. And like, even now we're mostly talking about um, like the black community within America. Um, if we extended that to all other races, all other ethnicities, um, genders, religion, sexualities, even like generations, um, once we expand that, you know, is it even feasible? <laughs> Would we have to go one at a time? Um, would we have to address them all at once? Yeah. So this is a hard question. And I think part of it, the reason why it's so difficult is because for many of the people in these communities, whether it be racial, social, sexual orientation, gender identity, right? Like this is a part of who you are. And so to move beyond it means what? That we don't call you that anymore? Does that change the way that you've been socialized? Right, like I mean, the you know, deeming it invisible doesn't mean that it doesn't matter anymore, even if it just matters to only you, right? And so the feasibility of moving beyond identity politics, I think is, and I think I should preface this by saying that I think the idea of moving beyond identity politics is, I think it's unrealistic. And I think it doesn't do us any favors, right? Like, I think that there is a beauty in the difference. And I think that instead of wanting to become post-racial or colorblind, like, being conscious of those differences and what it means doesn't inherently divide. And it's there that I think that's the focus, right? Because you can't ask a group of people who have been socialized, whether it be, you know, by just parental socialization or by like, you know, discriminatory practices that they've come to understand their being in a very specific kind of way. And then like, you know, all of a sudden we say we're done with it. And so I think it is, it feels less feasible to me um, and also less useful. I also realized that I answered your question directly after you answered it and did not wait for the second one. So I hope that that answered your question. Okay, so we will um, take Sean's question and also uh, there's a question. Uh, somebody 
is in the chat who wants to ask a question and could not Martha. raise her hand. Mm -hmm. You get the name Martha. So, uh, mm, uh, Sean and Martha, please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Wamel. Thank you very much for sharing your insight. Um, it was a, a very um, informative talk. Um, my question is, uh, in your experience, do you have a, uh, like an example of an, ex like an effective approach in which allies can participate? Um, sort of with the, sort of the phrase um, where intent and impact is sort of related, sure. where you can sort of have a, um, you know, a positive or a good intent, but your impact could be negative. Um, sort of in that light, that's, that's what I'm kind of asking. Sure. So I want to make sure that I'm understanding uh, your question uh, of an effective approach where your impact and your intent are doing are working in working in tandem together or where they're kind of divergent where you're kind of your intention was correct, but the like implementation kind of fell short. I just want to make sure that I answer which 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 one of those Where where they're in sync with each other. I, oh, I've seen sure. examples where they weren't, but I'm looking for the, the best case. Sure. Um, Let's take Martha's question. Oh, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me eye. Martha. Please go ahead. Um, I'm going to be more difficult. I graduated from Drew in 1969, where I think there were maybe tops three black students, whether they were African American or Caribbean American. Um, it was not an open university. Um, I'm active in the United Church of Christ and at my local church, and we have done a lot of anti-racism workshops. And what I'm not hearing anybody talk about here, and I think it's kind of too polite, is white privilege. So I would appreciate it if you would comment on white privilege and how to get away from the stereotypes that we use about who we are to overcome them. Okay. Got it. Um, so these questions kind of go in tandem with one another a little bit, so that's nice. Um, so to Sean's question, I think of an effective time where intent, so I think, um, and a specific example, it would take me a little bit of time to think through one, but if I had to conjure it, right, if I had to kind of conceptualize what that would look like for me, I think it's in a moment or an instance where we're seeing a, you know, a white ally willing to make some sort of sacrifice for themselves. Okay, so great example. So during a lot of the marches, what we have seen is like white individuals surrounding uh, black protesters as the police came forth. I think that's a very physical, physicalized example of what allyship looks like, right? Using white privilege, right, to Martha's point, as a means by which to protect and not doing so in a way that kind of garners, that specifically is garnering a kind of um, praise, right? So this is this is a relatively selfless thing, right? Because if you are doing this and you're standing in front of them, in front of the police, there's a belief that somehow like you might not get injured, but we know, right, what we've been seeing is that that is not always true, right? But there is still an inherent privilege that, you know, whiteness provides that can be protective. And I think that utilizing that privilege, right? Utilizing that understanding of, of society, utilizing, but and utilizing that in ways that are beneficial to people who don't have that privilege. Um, I think that that is, but that don't undermine, right? So then what I think to your other point, right? There are moments in which we see white individuals kind of either assuming things about experiences that people of color or black people have, have had, right? And then making choices that are paternalistic, right? Like, I know what's best for you. I've read the books. I know these things. And so I'm making choices that will then benefit you because I know, as opposed to listening, right? Um, and so I think the importance here is listening to the voices of the people that you are an ally to and that you are working to protect and advocate for and with, right? And so I think that sometimes 
the, the, what can happen is that advocacy can take out the form of a presumed knowledge and a presumed understanding without actively engaging in conversation with the people that you're advocating on behalf of. And so I think that, you know, one of the most effective forms of allyship is simply listening. Because what we know is that the way that race is worked in this country, specifically as it pertains to kind of race, residential segregation, means that most white people have no idea about the lived experiences of black people. And you can read all the books in the world and you can do all of those things and you can watch, you know, whatever you want to watch, but the knowledge, the inherent understanding and the knowledge of that is missing. And so it is hard to conceptualize an ally who is just doing based off of knowledge without actually engaging with the group. And so I think that in order to kind of make those two things right work in tandem, there has to be listening, right? There has to be an understanding. There has to be a, a more engaged kind of way in which you are thinking about your role as a privileged individual and recognizing that that privilege doesn't give you the right to make unilateral decisions on the part of other people, that you have to listen and engage because maybe what you think, you know, the marginalized communities want isn't what they're wanting, right? So I think one of the funny things that I've been seeing a lot of, we've been seeing a lot of murals of Black Lives Matter like on, in different cities. And one of the things that I've been seeing a lot on social media is people saying like, we just want equality, not a mural, right? And so I think that that's a really great example, right? Of people just giving you something that you never asked for. And it's a beautiful symbol and it's nice. And you know, everyone's taking pictures by it, but at the end of the day, it does not necessarily do the work, right? And so I think that listening is a very important part of allyship and then allowing, and which is, it's, a very important, but it's also very difficult, right? Because you may hear things you don't want to hear. Um, and so that, that recognition, I think, is the thing that can really guides the way in which particularly white allies, right, are able to do, to be allies and be very effective ones. Um, and then to Martha, I want to make sure that I understand what you're asking. So the idea of white privilege, right, and how to get away from the stereotypes. When you say the stereotypes, what do you mean? Oh, can you? Martin, are you on yes, mute? Yes, still muted. Okay. okay. You're good now. Go ahead. All right. What I mean is things like colorblind, mm -hmm. things like, um, you know, not really hearing people, ideas like, you know, that isn't me. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm Pennsylvania Dutch. I'm not white. Mm -hmm. um, I could keep going. Sure. There's I, books I got on it. it, but I I know you got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for that clarification. So I think. Um, Right, so I think what Martha's touching on is a very important point. So in 2017, after the Charlottesville. Um, what are we calling it? Whatever, the, the white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, right? A lot of people were like, that's not me, hashtag not all white people, right? Like making this very strong desire to distance themselves from those individuals. And I think that uh, what Martha is asking is kind of, how do we get away from that? And I think, so um, I'm gonna say this and I, and I mean it um, in a, a very specific way, right? Like white supremacy is, as a construct, is a very brilliant one, right? And part of the reason why it is so smart is because it's so invisible, right? And so that it becomes, so that when it gets called out, it feels like an attack, right? So when we hear white privilege, we often hear people say, well, I worked very hard. I've worked very hard my whole life. And so I know that like I have to, um, so I know that like I'm, I know, I, I know that I, 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 I've earned this, right? And I think that in a lot of ways, those, th that can be true, but it's the, the, it's the lack of juxtaposition to the lived experience of people who don't necessarily have the same kinds of privileges, right? And there are always gonna be outliers and there are always gonna be, but I think in order to really think about this, it's the hard part of this, Martha, is recognizing that it is you, right? That's part of you. And if it's not you, then it might be relatives. It might be, I mean, and I think 20, the 2016 election really brought this to bear for a lot of white people who kind of 
are real are kind of grappling with the ways in which they are um you know dealing with family members who they thought were relatively innocuous right or you know they said really racist they said <laughs> racist things but it was like oh it's fine you know they didn't mean it um and i think that now right that there's this desire to create this distance but part of this idea right is like it is you and it might not be you because you said it but you allowed it to be said and did not correct right and so that part of this is grappling with what whiteness is and means to you and I think lots of people will say, well, I don't know. But the reality is, is that it's all around you, but it's so invisible that you kind of have to do the work to take the scales off your eyes. But this also comes back to what I said to Sean, right? Which is listening. Listening to the people around you who are calling these things out and saying these things and acknowledging them and recognizing you might have a role in that. Um, and I think that that is really important, right? Is that like, it, you might not be out at, in Charlottesville with tiki torches, right? But that doesn't mean that you aren't complicit in the role that white supremacy has played and continues to play for so many people. And that acknowledgement and that, and the grappling with that is difficult work, but it's very important work. And so I think that that's, that's the part of it, how to get away from it is to call it out. It's to call it out in yourself. It's to call it out in your friends and your family members. It's to call it out at the Thanksgiving table because that's the most recent, that's the next holiday that's coming up if you're gonna be with family members, right? Like we're in the middle of this election, right? If this is something that you care about, call it out. And I think that that's the way that we move beyond. That's the way that we move, we, we are able not even to move beyond race, but we are able to kind of acknowledge and shine a light on the invisible kind of monster or invisible elephant in the room that is kind of whiteness and white privilege. So we have uh, 15 minutes approximately, and we have three hands up. So sure. why don't we take all the three questions together? Julian, is that fine? Yeah. Okay, so Professor Scott Wagen, Professor Jonathan Golden, and Kennedy Bug. Scott, sure. you first. Oh, you're uh, muted, hold on. Uh, Matt, can you unmute Professor Morgan? Matt? Yep, I got him. All right, can you hear me now? I think yeah. you probably can. Awesome. Um, nice to meet you, Dr. Wamble. It's so nice to meet you. Um, I'm Scott Morgan. I'm a social psychologist here at Drew in the psychology department. And I was fascinated with your talk and I was so thankful that I assigned it to my students for extra credit. And, um, so thank you for, for, for delivering tonight. Um, when you started your talk, you said you were gonna raise questions but not necessarily provide some ans provide answers. <laughs> And I think I want to at least ask, I want to, I want to invite you to share some of your insights or perspectives about something that I thought about. Um, because the paradox that's sort of at the heart of your talk, the one that really is at the heart of it, is something I think about whenever I teach my social psychology courses. Mm -hmm. On one hand, some of our theories and uh, ideas about how to reduce racism and prejudice is to, um, well, to, to pay attention to similarities and commonalities and shared humanity and on the other hand, we know that colorblind ideologies don't reduce racism and prejudice and stereotyping because um, you, you can't see injustice when, when it occurs. And not to mention that these racial, uh, that these identities, racial or otherwise, have meaning to people and they, sure. they care about them, live historically uh, embedded in just biographical meaning. So I guess what I'm curious to hear you talk about is your perspective on this sort of well, that that very thing that paradox that on one hand to reduce racism you have to sort of see the similarity and on the other hand to call out racial injustice you have to to um um you have to see see the difference um and so that's what i'm curious to hear that's what i'm curious i'm curious to be able to take your insights back to my students next time i teach those for psychology sure professor jonathan golden Yes, hello, uh, Dr. Wamble. It is really wonderful to, uh, to see you back here again. And uh, I just, on behalf, I'm sure all my colleagues feel the same way I do, that it makes us feel more legit to see you out there <laughs> sounding so good and doing so well. My question is, you know, all the, the theory and all this stuff is really brilliant. I want to actually appeal uh, directly to your political punditry here. You mentioned Joe Biden um, and his 
you know, kind of relationship with, with race, which is complex and fascinating right. in a lot of ways. I, I had an interesting conversation with a conservative the other day where I was kind of going on this thing about, you know, Donald Trump's racism and anti-Semitism and, and all of that. And this person felt compelled to remind me about, you know, a lot of that that actually comes from the left and cited Joe Biden's statement about, um, you know, you're not black if you don't vote for me or however, yeah. you know, I'm paraphrasing yeah, yeah, yeah. that. And I, I see how that is problematic in many, many ways. Um, but it also, it really, I don't buy it like if it's a, a kind of, um, you know, uh, like a, a, a um, you know, a Tucker Carlson narrative right. that, yeah, you know, he's just as racist. I, I don't buy that for one minute. So I'd really love to hear your insight just on, on that. Yeah, for sure. Kennedy. Mac. Hi. Oh, sorry. Hi. Thank you so much, Dr. Wimble. It was no your, your talk was super insightful. I had a question um, regarding the conversation of decolorization and just, um, mm. Just, yeah, um, I feel like in the past six months, uh, many people have been citing uh, Dr. King and saying that Dr. King would not have wanted us to riot. Uh, he would not have supported the looters, etc. So what's your position on just many people using uh, like revolutionaries like Dr. King and many others and just kind of picking and choosing uh, what they want yeah. to like say? Sure. Awesome. Um, okay. So I'll start with Scott's about like my thoughts on this perspective on the paradox, right? Because, in, and I think, so when I teach my race and politics class, one of the first things that I do is I have them read kind of um, social contact theory and kind of thinking about, you know, what does it take for good social contact to happen, um, right? And there are like, you know, Alport gives us these tenets, you know, where everyone has to be on the same playing field and everyone has to kind of like, recognize each other as being equals. It's like a really important part, right? As, as well as kind of dealing with um, being in the same space, but the notion of equality is kind of very multifaceted in the way that he presents it. And so, you know, every time, uh, particularly when I teach my race relations course, I always talk about like, you know, when we think about how, you know, interracial kind of contact how often is it that we're seeing that particular kind of equal dynamic? And I think that part of the reason why the paradox persists in the way that it does is because there is still this perceived kind of superiority inferiority, right? And so whether or not it is that white individuals are recognizing the role that they have played in kind of the systemic subjugation of uh, black and, you know, black and ind indigenous and people of color, they, it still comes from a place of like, and I'm at the top and now I'm looking down, which Alport tells us like, there's that you can't, you have to make it horizontal, right? Because, right. And so I think that, um, for me, my own perspective is that yes, like you have to see the similarities, but the problem is, is that the view of the similarities is still coming from the top down, right? And so I think that that then makes it difficult to, to kind of deal with the inequalities, right? Because you can call out the injustice, but if you're calling it out and, it's, and, it, and it is feeling like the mass is calling out the elite, then you know, you're still dealing with a very vertical kind of hierarchical structure. And what we know is that in order for these things to happen, you have to kind of create a very horizontal structure. And that's one of the things that we talk about a lot in kind of higher education, right? Is trying to create this very horizontal structure amongst, amongst students, right? Because you wanna create a space where everyone feels equal and every, everyone is able to kind of share their perspectives and not feel that any one's is better than the other. And that that has the potential to be effective in terms of kind of that level of communication. And so I think, you know, in terms of my own perspective, I think that you're right, that, you know, you have to do both of these things. But the trick of it is, is doing it in such a way where the hierarchy is flattened and, 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 and kind of recognizably so, so that everyone feels that they're all on the same page. Um, and I think that that's the hard part, right? Like that's the part of it that makes it very difficult because, because so much of the way that it's particularly in American society, race is so hierarchical. 
And white supremacy does make things very difficult to kind of level the playing field. And then when you reconcile that with the idea of like residential segregation, we are auto and economics and all the things that kind of come along and kind of build on top of these things, it becomes difficult for us to really see how to level the playing field in very meaningful ways. So I hope that that uh, touched on your point. Um, to Jonathan's point, so, so this quote from Joe Biden, I, I laughed. I will confess that I thought it was funny. Um, and part of the reason why is because it's not, okay, so it is not wrong. Now, we can't rescind someone's race. We can't do that. But based on the graph that I showed you, right, we know that Democrats, that Black people are disproportionately Democratic, right? And so that he's, what he's calling out is a true facet for the majority of the Black electorate, right? Which is that, and the work that I referenced earlier, the book Steadfast Democrats, um, it tells us that being a Democrat is just seen as a thing that Black people do. And there's a very strong social connection to the Democratic Party as a result of being Black. And so I think that the big problem with Joe Biden saying it is that it was Joe Biden saying it, right? That it wasn't, it wasn't the statement itself because that's speaking to a truth about a lot of Black people who are you know, active politically, right? That the Democratic Party and Blackness are very intricately um, intertwined. So then, it, so, so I, I, I would agree with you that like, to justify that statement and say that it is similar to other statements that have been made by other people um, on the right and some on the left, right, I think is a misnomer because I think that, was it ill-advised? Sure. Like, should he have said it? Absolutely not. Would we be having the same conversation if Kamala Harris had said it? No, right? And so I think, which is to say that some of the things that people on the right have said, if Black people said that, we would still be offended. And I think that that is kind of sometimes the barometer that I use. And so I think I would agree with you that like, it's not, I, I, it, to me, it's apples and oranges. It was a bad joke um, that he shouldn't have said, um, but it's speaking to a truth that again is not born out of, you know, like an ignorance on the part of Black voters, but it's, it, it speaks to a strategic nature with which they approach politics. It's just not one that a white man should be like voicing as like his own. And I think that that was the biggest mistake on his part for that. Mm. Um, oh, okay, Kennedy. So I think, I think to your, I think your question is a really interesting one because I, you know, as I alluded to at the end of my talk, right? We do hear a lot of people using kind of MLK's rhetoric as a justification for like, um, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. And I, you know, it's hard to say, we can't, we won't know. <laughs> and I think that that's my answer, right? There's no way to know. And so that when people make that love, that kind of invocation, it's like, are you, did MLK speak to you from the great beyond? Because if he didn't, then you, there's no way for you to know. And I think that that's the important part here, right? Is that, you know, we have to think about the intentionality of what um, Dr. King wanted, and then from there make our own decisions. And that is a right that he fought for, right? Our ability to make choices and our ability to understand what it is that we have the capacity to do. And, you know, uh, to be able to kind of prognosticate whether or not that is, you know, what he would want us to do, I think is a manipulative tool. And I think it is also a bastardization of a lot of what he stood for. And so I think we have to be careful when people invoke it because I think it can be very dangerous because we actually do not know. We're making assumptions based off of a person who has since passed. And I think that that can be, it's a very tricky space to be in. And I think it is, it's, it's, I personally think it's very manipulative and, uh, and problematic. And so, I, you know, yeah, I don't, I, I think we need to be wary of people who use that kind of rhetoric um, because I think it can be very, uh, very reductive in a lot of ways and that we have to be careful about that usage and that understanding. So 
I hope that answers your question. Awesome. So we are very close to 8.30. We have a couple of minutes. So um, I would uh, um, just like to thank Dr. Uh, Womble uh, for his generosity, for coming to Drew and giving such a wonderful talk. It was so insightful and it makes us uh, the department proud, Drew University proud, and we're really, really glad that you, at such a moment when race is such, race has become such an intractable problem, right? That we don't know how to move forward, right? And we don't know how to move forward at the level of society, and we don't know how to move forward at the level of university, right? And so this conversation is uh, in many ways very, very useful for us. So please join me in thanking Dr. Womble and yeah. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for joining. It was a very large turnout and uh, we will keep this conversation going. Uh, please keep an eye out for our future events. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you.